right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Improving Virtual Lunch and Learn. Today, we're going to be discussing the 2020 Scrum Guide update with a panel of Scrum experts. All right. Before we get started, though, uh, for those of you who are here live, I want to let you know how you can make this a more interactive experience. So there's a question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. I can't remember if I mirrored or not. Um, when you click on the question mark, it will allow you to submit a question for our panel. Speaking of our panel, I'm excited for you to get to hear from them. Uh, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves and I suppose I should introduce myself as well. Uh, I'm Blake McMillan. I'm a professional scrum trainer and a pro Kanban trainer here at Improving. Um, I've been with Improving for two years and it has been awesome. So now let me get our panelists to introduce themselves. Patricia, can you start us off? <laughs> Hi, my name is Patricia Kong. I don't know how to follow up after you, Blake. <laughs> my name is Patricia Kong. I, um, I've been at scrum.org for almost nine years. And uh, what I think about here is about enterprise and leadership solutions. So what that means is that generally we know the competence of an awesome scrum and agile team, and then they hit the eh, so what is the outside of that look like? And that's generally where I'm uh, I'm playing. So, so that's what I'm doing. And I will shoot it off to Ty because you're on my right. Cool. Right. Um, hi, my name is Ty Crockett. I'm a professional scrum trainer, and um, I uh, I train a few different classes in that space. Um, I have huge passions in other spaces, um, people being the number one thing. Um, I'm also a consultant. I do a lot of consultation at an enterprise level, helping organizations figure out how they can do this and how they can just do their thing, whatever that may be. And then um, working with just humans and individuals, helping them realize their potential. Don, that, that leaves me. Uh, <laughs> I'm Don McGrail. Uh, I've been improving for like 14 years now. Um, it's crazy. It's it's gone so fast. And um, I uh, a professional scrum trainer, and uh, and and wrote a book as well, professional product owner. For, so the the product owner role is a bit of my jam. And and uh, so I train, I coach, I consult, uh, but yeah, especially on the product owner side. Very nice. Now, Patricia, it's only fair since Don flashed his book. You got to flash yours. Let's see it. Oh, it's there it is. Oh, Don's got it for you. Don's got it for you. Look at that. That's see right away. It's team <laughs> and it's teamwork to make the dream work. All right. Cool. Wait, wait. Let's let Ty flash his 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 mold book. I'm all stuck. I don't I don't know where I put it at. Don, can you <laughs> <laughs> get all your stuff hanging around? I here. draw things. And I'll <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. So let's get into this thing. Um, so the Scrum Guide uh, just got updated, and we say just got updated, eh, you know, Novemberish, whatever. Um, but what we, what I want us to do first is I want us to kind of talk about why is it important for folks on this call to know what's changed in the Scrum Guide. What do you guys think? I could uh, jump on that one, I guess. <laughs> um, you know. Actually, if you've been doing Scrum the right way, if you've been getting a lot of value out of Scrum, probably not much, to be quite honest. You know, it, it, it's really designed to, you know, the things that we're seeing. I mean, we when we teach classes, we consult with people, like we see sort of common threads, patterns, mm -hmm. um, and and this was kind of designed to to tighten that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So things like a whole Scrum team rather than a Scrum within a Scrum team. That was mm -hmm. that was that was really about not not having like separation between product owner and the scrum master and that team but it, real scrum teams were all together anyways we're working as a team regardless so yeah yeah i i think of a couple things so in in general i think for this call just to see how uh widely used scrum has become and so the the notion that it's becoming more general we're not just talking about the software development industry mm -hmm. um I think that that's important because it's much more inclusive. And so what we see in the change in the document is that it, there's there's the way that it's headed. And as someone who, you know, I don't want to call myself a methodologist, but someone who creates frameworks and has to write about it, it's it's more about the principles now that are under it. And, and I really see that for the future, I mean, that's a really important thing to, to understand. I would put in um, following up with the uh, what, what she said, 
if you're doing complex work, but you've been struggling with like, well, how do I fit this in? Um, there should still be space for you. There was something that Ken said earlier when he was talking about why to do this, and he was discussing someone who was doing complex work in the medical field, and it was cutting edge right out there. There had been somebody who'd gone before them so they could follow in their footsteps. Mm -hmm. That type of work should still be able to fit here, especially if it's something that you're trying to reduce the complexity of that space. Uh, so this now starts to open up to more of those fields. Uh, more and more of the work that we tend to do seems to be not just in the technical or software field. Yeah, Ken Schreiber likes to talk about a a guy he knows who's using Scrum to work with autistic his autistic son. Right? Mm -hmm. it gets, it's applicable even at that level. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because you know back in the day when uh, when Ken and Jeff were creating Scrum, it was because they're like, oh software development it's a mess but like now we're seeing that hey this isn't just about software and we see that also in the agile community right because in the agile community again you know that kind of scrum was one of the voices there and so like we're starting to see people are like hey we could do agile stuff and we're not even in technology this this so. very relevant like so i have i have like a little treasure chest right here and this is a, a paper from 95 um to submit around the scrum development process and i'll just read the subject or you know what the the title of it would was which was how i learned to develop systems without chain or how i learned to live with myself and without waterfall or spiral <laughs> <laughs> patricia's at the headquarters of scrum.org there right and right above uh the very first scrum team wasn't it weren't they in that same building yeah, they're in that in, in this building, and I write my office. I think is right above it. So, that's, so that's, she's digging up. You're digging up treasure treasure troves <laughs> all over the place from <laughs> finding things in office. Geeking out. <laughs> the archives, like I almost expected to be on parchment, and you're like, oh look, and you see this, the words like in fire, like you know, this is scrum. Like COVID, what are you going? I'm going to go to the office and read some old documents about scrum. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, one of the things that uh, th that I've heard people say is like, wait, you know, so why is, why is Scrum changing? Um, and when I talk to him, I say, you know, this isn't the first time that the Scrum Guide has changed. Um, can you guys share some of the changes from the past that you thought were significant changes to the Scrum Guide uh, as it as it adapted over the years? I'll, I'll start and throw out. Um, some of the things that we got rid of, there was times where uh, I remember in one instance, I was working with a product owner who's one of the best that I know of today. And um, I'm first teaching her this, and she's going for an MBA at the time that we're doing this. And she, we're talking about release planning. She has all these different techniques that she's going to use to plan out how she's going to do some projections on what a possible future might look like. And um, I'm like, oh, no, no, I got this, this one play. And she's like, oh, I don't want to use that play. And I'm like, but this is this is the one play. <laughs> and so some of the things that we've released over time, release planning being one of them, that was a pretty significant one that impacted me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then she had these amazing ways of doing it that she was kind of getting from her very awesome MBA program. There were better ways for us to approach our specific problems. So mm -hmm. knowing when you don't have the single play was a really big one. Release planning mm -hmm. was that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. What else? Another big one, I guess, would be the um, the Scrum values. Yes. Uh, I forget how long ago that was, but I mean, they were always a part of Scrum, but they were really like put up front and discussed. And, and that was really about, you know, the what you see a lot out there is just the 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 uh, celeb celebratory practices of Scrum, right? The ceremonies that would happen. Mm. We would just go through the ceremony, stand up for 15 minutes a day, and all of a sudden, like product would appear. Um, so it was really about giving a reason for why we do these things. If we're not mm -hmm. improving on those values of openness and focus and respect and courage and commitment, if we're not improving on those, why are we doing this? We should be measuring ourselves against this all the time. So just that refocusing was a big, a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember when that change happened. I think it was 2017. I don't remember uh, exactly, but what I do remember is when I think someone had asked Ken um, Schwaber, who's the, the, the co-founder of Scrum Network, um, 
you know, which which value, which of those five values are the most important to you? And he had said, well, I think you start with commitment because if you're not going to commit all those other things, you know, do they do they matter? Like if you're not in it to to win it, then then maybe those other values um, don't matter. One um, change that I think or two changes that that I think had an impact on me is I remember when you remember the three questions and you talk about what you do. And you go like this at the daily scrum journal, like I did this and this is what I did yesterday, this is what I do today. I think that change of where it was above the team and then just making those questions optional, I think that was a very different because I remember going to the daily scrum and being like this. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that was a slow, that was a slow abandon of those, right? Because it started with, you must do it this way. It was kind of the feeling people got. And then in one version, it was, here's something you could do. And then just in this last one was finally they're just gone. They're not there anymore. Yeah, and it's interesting because the the removal of the three questions, first of all, I was like an answer to prayers. But uh, <laughs> second of all, like it's kind of neat because it looks like it's a it's a less prescriptive type of scrum guide. Um, so tell me this scrum guide it's less prescriptive because you know there's there's fewer pages obviously why is that a good thing i'll go back to my situation uh when it was prescriptive on release planning you got that one play and here's the deal um the people who are doing this have an expert in a place but there's a lot of places and they don't have expertise in every one of those places mm -hmm. and so if there is space to put options down, we want to make sure that the people using Scrum can actually use those options. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as you start limiting those, like let's limit the things we must, the things that are best for us, but not everything. Yeah, that's that's key, right? Scrum is always designed as a, uh, I like to refer to it as an additive framework. You're only gonna be successful if you add to it. Bare bones is min minimally sufficient, I think is, how we refer to it but then it allows you to be creative and experiment with it i think it gives it legs it's got staying power because the way we've done so many things in scrum has changed quite a bit over the years but scrum itself hasn't changed that much the framework has not changed that much mm -hmm. but the types of tools and techniques and practices we use for populating a product backlog or doing a daily scrum or um scheduling sprints uh, any one of those things and in product owners like there's a whole lot of practices that have come and gone in that field. Uh, we want to leave that open. And that's why keeping it less prescriptive and just simple, simple rules um, is, is what makes it as good as it is. Yeah. I feel like that's a polite way of how I would have said it, which was <laughs> going to force people to think like nobody told you to stop thinking and now you really are forced into to, to address your context. So even when we talk about different industries, I was just talking to someone who's working um, with the clients. They're using Scrum and Agile in, in construction. Mm -hmm. Completely different. And then you would think that that's very sequential or what are they trying to do? So there, there's there's some interesting things for us to learn in other spaces. Yeah, that's that's neat. And I and I I, I like where where all of your heads are at. Where what you're seeing is is if if Scrum was really prescriptive, then it probably wouldn't be very applicable outside of just a single area. But because it's not prescriptive, and as, as Don was saying, it's uh, it's an additive framework, we start with the bare bones, and then we say, okay, now what do we need to add on to this to make it work for us? So that's cool. Um, so this is this is one of the questions that I was really excited about as I, as I started thinking, I was like, I wonder what they're gonna say. Um, what are some of the changes that you're really excited about in the 2020 Scrum Guide? I can uh, jump on that. There's there's a few. I, I was sort of hitting on it before, but as a product owner, this one excites me as well. Is is it's now I can think of several, but but it is really moving <laughs> moving away from moving away from that. You know, they're used to say scrum team and a development team. And, and, you know, maybe for a lot of you out there, it didn't really matter. You worked as a, as a complete team, but I saw a lot of, you know, de development team wants something. They ask a question of a product owner who goes ask the question to somebody mm -hmm. else. And if they want something in terms of the of, of the organization, they go to the scrum master who goes to somebody else. And 
we used to draw it like a we used to call it the Mickey Mouse diagram, right? You've got the development team, and then on the edges, the two ears are the product owner and the scrum master. And and you know, I don't know if it was the cause, but but certainly what we saw out there a lot was was this kind of go through pass through proxy kind of relationships. And anything that had to do with the product, it was like, that's the product owner's job. Anything mm. process related, that's the scrum mm. master's job. But mm -hmm. the reality is we want everybody thinking in terms of product and process. The the process is owned by the whole scrum team, mm. not the scrum master, mm -hmm. uh, even though that was never the intent of scrum. And the product, that should be everybody's focus. They should be able mm. to talk to customers. Everybody should be able to. Um, everybody should take ownership of the vision. Um, yeah, so that's what I like is just one team, not two teams. So Don, I'll tell you, um, like one of the things when you're when you're doing uh, scrum training is you try to be really precise with your language. If I had a jar that I had to put a nickel in every time I caught myself about to say development team, I'd you know be able to buy a super fancy lunch or something because I'm <laughs> always I'm always messing up, right? Because it's like I, I just got used to saying development team, development team, development team. Now I'm like scrum team and the developers and the developers and the scrum team. So that was even though I, I'm with you, I think it's a really important change. It's a really cool change. Gosh, I, I keep tripping over that all the time because I just got used to talking about the development team. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> yeah. I um, So I think we've been hitting on the things that have gotten us excited, which was the inclusivity, right? So it's not just software development. We're yeah. talking about the accountabilities versus roles now. And I think um, I think in general, there's that 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 push toward value and really thinking about why with the product mm -hmm. goal. And then, of course, you know, I think about um, the enterprise. So I really like this this notion, especially with evidence based management, that we're putting more accountability to measurement. Do we know that that's that's working toward us? But really, that why and having that 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 direction is making something, uh, making the guide a little bit more elegant and and, and useful. I think in a, a business context. So. I think those are all great, great things. I think the um, Ty, you should take this, but like the the notion of servant leadership and how that's that's out. Is that your favorite? <laughs> no, I was like, I was all pulled out. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I, I think I had to have a lot of conversations when it came to I'm like, oh, not this one. No, no, don't, no, don't do this. Anything but that. Um, I'm I'm so in love with servant leadership, but I know that it is not the only type of leadership, and there are definitely ways to get there. And there are spaces, and this is going to sound like heresy, but there are spaces where I may not use servant leadership. Um, last year, a little bit before this time, um, Don and I were engaged in like two and a half day sprints, and I think in the first one we were just checking to see if this would make sense. I don't think we were using servant leadership during that time period. We didn't have long term plans. We didn't know if the team would stay together. We were just going to go in and investigate if the job was going to get done. And so there are some spaces where you could have this is one of those more open. There's more than one way to do it. But just go ahead. Yeah. And I just want to be very clear that everybody knows what we're talking about here is that yes. the term servant leadership has been removed from the Scrum Guide mm -hmm. in 2020. And it has been, you know, out there, I've seen a bit of ruckus around it still <laughs> says the word serve um on it uh, but it's 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 you know i think i think we would chalk it up to a practice it's a fantastic practice i mean if you're not if you're not doing that or following some of the teachings of servant leadership as a scrum master i think you're missing out but i could say that about a lot of awesome practices that aren't in the scrum guide right um this is this is one are you following everything that Greenleaf talks about with servant leadership. Do you have to follow all the tenants um, in order to be a scrum master in scrum? So I think it's really just that the more commoditized terms like scrum, servant leadership become, the less it belongs in the scrum guide, right? Because it, 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 it becomes restrictive. What if we come up with a whole new way of, 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 of leading successfully? You know, probably not, but what if? I, I, I think one of the things that you specified, which is really great, is this notion of um, that the scrum master, it, it's a it's a leadership role, right? I'll use the word role. And one of the ways you do that is through serving. And when you look at the levels of, of, of mindsets and of leadership, right? So let's say fixed mindset, growth mindset, 
And then there's something else that's called the benefit mindset. It is about how are you serving others? What are you doing to improve not only yourself, but you know, in service of society? So there's there's really there's a little bit of uh, some nuance there in how we how we how we do lead. Yeah, I, the uh, the thing with uh, servant leadership that I thought was uh, like a really important element uh, when I was uh, learning and studying Scrum is the fact that you're using influence. The fact that you are you are accomplishing for yourself by helping others achieve. And to me, that was a that was a big piece. Uh, and I don't think we I don't think that's that's over with, right? Just because we were not using that term. As Scrum Masters, we still rely on influence, not on hierarchical control or, you know, uh, using uh, threats or anything like that. So sorry, Scrum Masters out there. If you're using threats, you can't start it. You can't start it. You can't start that. <laughs> um, what are some other things? I mean, there's there's a ton of new changes. Yeah. I want to put like as far as my favorite thing, I, I, I I'm always looking at the parts of like Every time that I go do Scrum with someone, what am I adding to it? Like I'm adding it every single time. And I can think of like any agenda that I might've written up for sprint planning or sprint review or something like that. There's always vision at the top of it. Even if we're gonna do like a three day thing or a one week or a, just a specific project, like there's some visionary concept that leads us somewhere. And so I've always wanted that to be added. And so with the, in the addition of the product goal, I think that was like a huge thing. Not the same thing, but that addition was huge for, for me personally in seeing that, okay, this bigger picture ideal that we're striving towards. So that's that's really cool. That's a nice cue up because that's one of the ones <laughs> I wanted to make sure we open up that can of worms here together. So product vision, product goal. Let's start talking about that a little bit. What's the <laughs> I don't know where you're pointing, but I'll over this. <laughs> I think it's a you. Whatever it is, it's a you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm with Ty. I mean, as a product owner, vision is crucial. It's, it's like the number one thing you can use to, for team motivation, right? Is 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 introduce whose lives are being improved by the work we're doing. Make it very very clear, and and then even better if we can meet them, right? Um, so I actually had the opportunity because because you know this was. Um, you know, as PSTs, we got to see an earlier version of this, and and that was a big question. And and I, Ken Schraber answered it like, why not use vision? Why is it why is it protocol? And and basically, it comes down to a couple things. But the main thing was vision is aspirational. You may never achieve it, right? We want to we want to be we want to cure the world of some disease or of poverty. I mean, these are good things we should be always moving towards five, ten years down the road. Um, product goal is measurable and it should be and it should help us define the product backlog not everything in the product backlog needs to map to the product goal but that should give it some voice right mm -hmm. so it's it's that was the main thing that came across is it should be something that's measurable so in that case as a product owner i never saw a product backlog much use beyond six months to a year right it, it, i couldn't see much further than that i might have roadmaps or other things i might create for that like high level things and the product goal gave me would give me direction in that. And even before this product goal came out with Scrum, you know, there were things I would use on top of vision, like, you know, the 4DX practices, a widely important goal where, you know, we want to achieve something, we want to change something within the next six months to a year, quarter or something like that. And so that provides focus for the product backlog. It's moving us, and I guess it's literally they're calling it the commitment of the product backlog now mm -hmm. is the product goal. So I guess to sum it up, you know, look for something that's measurable that you and the team understand, and it gets us closer to this aspirational vision, but it's not the vision. Mm -hmm. I um, I also like the other aspect of the product goal, which is the fluidity it allows for us to connect what we were doing before to tomorrow, the next sprint. And so I think that, that that's something that gives us a little bit more purpose. And even during these times of COVID, when this was when this was released and we were talking about it, there were organizations that were like, you know what, our goal, all those other things, but our goal right now is that in the next three months, we're not laying anybody off. Mm -hmm. So, we're, you know, and so like using that to restructure it for their purpose was very interesting in how they started to think about um, about even the notion of goals just beyond the spring goal was, uh, was interesting. Yeah, when I saw the product goal, 
I was really excited about it because to me, the product goal reaches out and touches focus in a way that is so amazing, but also a little scary because there's some very specific language. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what, why don't we go ahead and open that can of worms too? Because one of the things I hear is like, oh yeah, product goal, that sounds awesome. We're going to have four of them. I'm like, <laughs> not for one product we're gonna have <laughs> one let's talk about that one product goal and, and it's just something like in, in order to take another one you have to complete it or abandon one right or um, abandon it. <laughs> it, it this is ultimately it's it's focused right why do we have one sprint goal in a sprint does that mean we're, we're not able to do anything else in the sprint? Can we work on things that aren't related to the sprint goal? We, I mean, there are things that we need to do, but above all else, when push comes to shove, mm -hmm. it's the sprint goal that we hold up. And, and that's what's important about the product goal too. So it's not like you can't have other things, other, other goals, you can call them goals if you want. There's one product goal. And you could even have, I, 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 I can imagine plenty of scenarios where you'd have a sprint that had nothing to do with the product goal, but you got to do it. Some regulatory thing, it doesn't mean we have to change our product mm -hmm. goal. The goal of the product hasn't changed, but we right. had to step it and go in this other direction for a sprint or two. Um, not every single thing have, has to map to the product goal. It should. I mean, I would want to know why, but there's probably good reasons why it shouldn't. So this isn't like you can only do one thing ever again <laughs> with it. And I, and I know that sometimes we, we we latch on to something and, and look at it that way. Anyway, this is the way I look at it is if you want to have other goals and objectives, do it. But there's this is the one thing that gives us focus. Whenever something gets added to the product backlog, we should ask, how does this fit into the product goal? And if we can't explain why, then we must be able to justify it in other ways. Well, because of this other compliance thing or this other important report that this customer wants. It, nothing to do with the product goal, but we got to do it and everybody understands why. So yeah, it doesn't mean we can't look at anything else, but we have yeah, one exactly. direction. Yeah. And I like how you're talking about that the uh, when we when we have something that's that's you know towards the top of our product backlog and it's not aligned with the product goal, that's a conversation, right? Let's have a conversation. Let's let's talk about why it's there. Because I don't know about you guys, but one of the things that I've seen as I've worked with people is a lack of cohesion in the product backlog, right as it's getting ready to be brought into the sprint. Like, what do these product backlogs have to do with each other? I don't know. I mean, that guy said he wanted it. That lady said she wanted this. So we're just doing the stuff, man. I mean, the hope is that it'll drive some some um, some focus, right? Because there's, um, I think the the focus, especially right now, as we innovate and we have to say no, and every penny counts where we're investing and reinvesting. Mm -hmm. I hope that drives the focus and removes the variables. But like, I did a very informal survey, especially looking at scaling, and it was like um are your are your scrum teams working off more than one product backlog 100 percent said yes so you know there's there's a lot hopefully that can be trained in i would add in um it's doing its job too when it's just the one if you will find yourself abandoning your product goal rapidly or you find yourself abandoning your abandoning your product goal frequently something more than you would be comfortable with, that's an indicator for you. Go back and check mm -hmm. out what you're doing. There, there, there may be a problem and it may be somewhere that you need to go investigate. Scrum's doing its job and it's letting you know that something may be amiss. And that's the poster that we draw every <laughs> single class. Scrum doesn't solve your problems, it exposes them. That's true. Um, yes. So I got, uh, uh, I've been watching some of the questions and mm -hmm. this one just came up and I want to I, I want to just ask it now because I think it's kind of an interesting one and when we're on this topic um, if a prod uh, if a project vision or product vision or goal wasn't provided initially is there ever a time where it's too late to regroup and develop a vision for the team that's easy no yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that's I, I, honestly, that's the majority of the, the teams I work with and products I work with is they, they, they've we start talking about visions and product goals and mm -hmm. but the ma vast majority of the people we work with are already working on a product that's been around forever. Mm -hmm. um, and but, but it still doesn't have this or even if you have one, should you even revisit it? Right. 
mm. should be something that you should expect to do from time to time. So go uh, go re- regrouping can create a wh- whole lot of new excitement around your product. Mm-hmm. If you don't have one, go do it. And that's what a lot of people coming out of our classes end up saying and doing. It's like, hey, I, we asked for action items at the end of the class, right? It's like, here's what I'm going to do when I can, I'm going to put this to use. A lot of it is, I'm going to go figure out what our vision is, or I'm going to maybe put it to paper. I'm going to communicate it. I know what it is, but nobody else does. Well, that's useless then. So absolutely, uh, it's never too late. And even if you have one, it's worth repeating, change it, right? Ask Kodak. <laughs> You should you should <laughs> revisit those visions from time to time because you may need to pivot. Ouch. One of the, <laughs> Sorry, too soon. <laughs> one of the things that I got when I first started going down the trainer route, I got a piece of advice from Don, and it is so valuable to me today. And it was this simple thing that sounds kind of cheesy. Um, <laughs> and this is why it took me a long time to get it. Do the best you can. And so, hey, I didn't get that stuff out front. So what can I do now? Just do the best you can. Um, and there's so many different things that you can go. You, we started out in the wrong way and we found that we needed to do it later. Um, don't just apply that to this particular commitment or that particular event. Um, apply it to everything. Do the best you can and do it as soon as you can. Um, so whenever you can change, do it. Scrum is built that way. And if you find that you don't have enough opportunities to change, Make sure you have more frequent opportunities, so shorten the length of things. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'll, uh, uh, I definitely wanted to make sure we talked about the product goal because that's kind of one of my personal uh, favorites. What else, what else are some of the changes that you were just like so excited about when you saw it? I'm gonna go back to the, it's not a big one, like it's not the big overall or something specific. It's the overall less prescriptive piece. There are so many times where I felt that people were struggling with, yeah, everything in Scrum is fantastic. And then there's one little thing, right? But when it becomes less prescriptive and it invites more things in, different industries that feel like they can connect, can now come play, different groups that have types of work they didn't feel like fit in the space. Well, my stuff isn't super complex or, or, or my stuff, I already kind of know what I need to do. This would really be nice though, just to help me get through my workload. Uh, my sister works in tax accounting and they do Scrum. Um, so I think there's some, there's some really good places that are able to be attacked because of the less prescriptive piece coming into play. And one thing we haven't really brought up, and I see a question that is sort of similar to it, but is is the whole commitments thing, right? So we know commitment is a mm-hmm. is is one of the core values of Scrum, but bringing that back in in terms, of, okay, what do we mean by that? Mm-hmm. Well, with things like definition of done, things like the 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 sprinkle have been in Scrum for a while. They've been mm-hmm. talked about, but what were they? They didn't really have a home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then the product goal introduced as well, and then they kind of put them all together in this, you know, and they, they're not, what are they artifacts? Well, they kind of associate with artifacts, right? So the definition of done is really describing the increment, like what makes an increment. There's this one line in, this, in, the, in the new Scrum Guide that I love is, you know, the, the moment a product backlog item meets that definition of done, an increment is born. Which gets you thinking. We're not waiting until the end of the sprint necessarily. We're doing this throughout the sprint, and we're, we're we've got an increment. Then we build it. We could take something else, and we get it to the definition of done. We had another increment. So the increment is growing, and the definition of done is a commitment that we take on for that increment. When we say an increment is done, what do we mean? We commit to that. This is what we mean. The definition of done, mm. and then with the sprint goal, which has been there for a while. But how how do we know we're the, that we're heading in the right direction? Or have we achieved the sprinkle? That's our commitment. We no longer commit to like things on a product backlog. Like mm-hmm. we we did get to all nine. We got eight of nine done, so we failed the sprint. No, <laughs> did we achieve the sprinkle? And that's our commitment is the sprinkle. So we don't commit to that. We forecast how many items we can achieve, but we commit to the sprinkle commitment again. And then now with the product goal, and this is one of the questions I saw come in was, well, I, it was, I don't understand what we mean by the product goal is in the product backlog. Well, that's what we mean. It's not like another line item of the product backlog. It's part of the product backlog, just like the sprint goal is part of this sprint backlog. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's our commitment for the product backlog. 
that original, uh, that one of those original books, the silver one, uh, Agile Project Management with Scrum, it talked about themes. And if you looked at this, you could feel this is a theme that arises from this. Um, and it's just a more definite space inside the theme. Yeah, I uh, the the thing that Don said uh, is that with with adding the commitments to the artifacts, we finally kind of rooted the the definition of done and sprint goal so that like they are they are attached. And so there's we we know for sure like hey this is a part of Scrum. This is not optional anymore. Don't think you can just say oh yeah we'll sprint goals. That's for the advanced teams. But well, yeah we're we're just gonna get all the stuff done. It's like no no no. That is the second worst sprint goal ever. Is do all the stuff. Right, the first worst sprint goal, no sprint goal. All right, uh, what is something that that changed in the Scrum Guide that you were kind of like, oh, but I liked that. Why? Uh, oh no, we talked about servant leadership already, Ty. So Ty's like, I think it's time again for me to talk about servant <laughs> leadership. No, no. Let's. Uh, what what's something that that you guys that when when you saw it you're like oh, oh I I don't know about this one. Anything come to mind? For for me, um, and we have already talked about the positivities about it, but I was I was um, maybe, you know, the choice of word, but the notion of commitments, the commitments, um, but with the understanding that it gives a home to those to those things, I think was for me just something to, to wrap my head up. But maybe it was just I was I was I was picking on words, but it made it made perfect sense. So that was just something for me that was a little bit like, oh, why are they going to be going to be used in a harmful way? You know, I was just thinking about words, just words. And if I had to really pick one too, it's like the move from self-organization to self-management as well. So mm -hmm. if you don't know, <clears throat> yeah. it used to be dev team was a self-organizing entity and, and now since there's no dev team it's like a scrum team with developers and product owner scrum master it became self-managing instead so but i and i saw a lot of like complaining i i guess it, to me it was a change that didn't need to happen and it maybe took a lot of i don't know like attention away from the more crucial parts of it i don't think it's that big of a deal because i think most can't define it, it actually the dictionaries don't define it in the same, you know, in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. So just get into these big debates. Or what do we? What did that mean by going from self-organization to self-management? And now we manage. And I, I didn't think it had to happen, but yeah. I don't think I, it should be a deal either. I definitely spent hours going down the science of self-management versus self-organization <laughs> from an OB perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I've had to talk about it and dissect it when I didn't think it was the end result. Was, didn't change much at all. So I think this is funny because as scrum nerds, which we four are, um, the the funny thing is we get all wrapped up in the language sometimes. Like we like you know we we're, we're going to dissect like okay it, it used to be self organization now self management hmm what are, what are the implications? And I read one of the questions and it, it kind of comes from the other side of non scrum nerdery, which is the hey like. Uh, sometimes companies like they're they're starting to try to use Scrum, and you know they're just kind of like you know renaming stuff a little bit, and they're you know they'll change the name of something to kind of suit more of them. Why is that a big Why is that a big deal? I think this has been a part of Scrum since the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that um, I remember being said earlier was. Um, we didn't want to keep the same names. If you if you called this role a project manager, if you mm. use the words that were being used there, if you called this a project, uh, then people would be expecting the same behaviors, yeah. the same things to happen. It is different. It needs to be something different. It needs to feel different. You're doing something different. Um, this is another part where like what the roles and responsibilities exist and the accountabilities around things. So seeing what you have to do is different activities. When you start talking about what people actually have to do and what and what the event's purpose is, they're different than what we were doing before. So we want it to have a different name. Mm. I think I, I don't yeah. think that's in this version of the Scrum Guide. That's right, right. been Scrum since the beginning. I've heard Ken Shriver say that, right? He's like, I, I, I can't justify the names of all these. Are they really, are they the best names? I, I don't know. Like. Sprint sounds exhausting. It shouldn't feel exhausting, <laughs> you know. And, and a backlog is like something stuck. Uh, 
it doesn't they're not necessarily the best names but i do remember him saying but one thing i knew for sure i just needed them to do something different than what they were doing and if we use the same link like backlog is a requirements list and a sprint mm-hmm. is a mm-hmm. is a is an iteration and a scrum master is a project manager or product owner is a product manager whatever and then if they already have those titles they already oh well we already do that so we're good right um, it just needs to feel different and it's probably another vote for why they why product goal is not vision because product goal is different right it's there's no those two words together you just don't see that often out there yeah i think it's um i think there is another side of it though that um we don't often talk about but i've been asked um to proclaim that scrum is for everything scrum is for everyone you know? it's like no <laughs> you know so that's something to be aware of and it's just not it's just not it, it, it isn't for everything so it might not be the right approach to everything but looking at the intent the intent if it speaks to you could be could be correct but if you're just going to rename and call all your project managers scrum masters and you know and that won't necessarily feel different like you guys said yeah it doesn't really make that change happen um so there's a there's a question as i'm kind of looking over the questions because i'm looking at the time looking at the questions um there was this question that I saw that I, I wanted to uh, put to you guys because you, you probably would know a little bit better. Do you feel like Scrum is uh, is being changed by the guide or is the guide getting just closer to what Ken and Jeff were originally thinking? What do you think? I think I know what Ken and Jeff would say. Well, what they say? I don't want to step in. <laughs> yeah show that again that was that was like a 200 and something page document on the scrum on scrum I'll right be, that was developed I'll be, I'll be back in a second <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i i probably this is it's getting closer to what they were always wanted to imagine is is likely what they would say right but i don't know you know what it's like building anything as you learn as you go and you evolve and and you know now you see in other parts of the industry or industries out there that's focus on product thinking and product focus and i think that's had some influence on the guide as well um so i think scrum is evolving in a good way not huge but just to make it so that make it easier for people to apply in lots of different spaces i'll tell you this i mean obviously in 2001 when the when the, the 17 dudes they're all dudes i guess it wrote the the agile manifesto they put software right in there i mean obviously they weren't thinking of this stuff back then right i don't think any any of them could have predicted the that that it would have gone beyond the it industry and software um and and i actually was at the 2011 agile conference where i think 16 of the 17 were there and they said that exact same thing um they said if they could have changed one thing in the agile manifesto and ken and jeff were there it would have been the word software they would have made it about product or something. So th- they couldn't have predicted all this. Uh, we're always learning. And like any good empirical practice, we should be ev- evolving with it. And so Scrum, represented by the Scrum Guide. The world that we build stuff in, I think, has a lot to do with this too. Like mm. those, they couldn't have predicted this is where the world is going to go. The channels that people are selling things through, the methods and means that you can get your product, goods, services, whatever you have out to people, it's all so crazy, I think, compared to what we were thinking, you know, 20 years ago. So no. Yeah, I think I think adapting for the times is is certainly um, one thing. I, I know that for, for Kent Faber, um, his mission is to improve the profession of software development. And it was for him and the conversations that I've had, he said, you know, Patricia, this is what I know. It seems seems enough, right? Just looking at here and just seeing that adapt with the way that the world has changed and all the things that we're thinking about and and how he is it is joyous to see how Scrum has been used in, in other ways. But I, I do think that, you know, could they have applied more? And when you see all those pages, it's trying to define like this is how it would look if it was perfect, but understanding and not actually not thinking about how it could be used, but organizations still might not improve. So I know that in 2015, that's when Ken was saying, you know, all these other things that are coming out as agile scrum and all these things his question was you know how do we know that this is actually helping how do i know that i'm improving professionalism how do we 
actually know that this is a better way of working? What would we look at? So he's he's constantly questioning those things. What is the next way to help improve professionalism? So that leads me into a question that I think you will be uniquely positioned to answer, Patricia. How much Scrum does Scrum.org use in its day-to-day uh, uh, way of working? Yes. <laughs> they use Kanban. <laughs> <laughs> How much? Just enough or not enough? Um, we 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 actually have two teams. We work in two week cadences. Something that's scrumish, uh, but it's a uh, it's always a place that we can get better. Uh, I know you guys I know have. That Go ahead. Every sorry, time Don. I'm sorry, I was just saying. Whenever I ask, hey, can we have a quick meeting or something? They're always saying, oh, I've got a daily scrum to go to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and they always tell me when I ask for things, oh, it's on the backlog. It's on the product <laughs> backlog. <laughs> That's like the best <laughs> answer <laughs> ever, though. <laughs> I have a product owner. I know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> go, yeah, could you tell me where it is in the order, though? They're like, oh, it's kind of too hard to count that far down. <laughs> All right, let me look at some of the questions. We're starting to get kind of late in time. I want to make sure we get to some of them. Um, how about this one? What are some techniques or suggestions you'd recommend to help an organization transition from that, that, that business is separate from technology into like, we're going to start working together as one team? Um, I, I do a lot of consulting and I think one of the things that I try to bring to organizations when I first go to them is there are process or um, framework problems. Uh, oftentimes we're talking about process, like what they're going to do repetitively to make their stuff better. And then there are just behavioral and people problems. Like these kind of things, we might try to fix them with some, some process that we might put in place. And it might help. But at the end of the day, that concept is a people issue. Um, we are one team, but we look at ourselves as different teams. It's a us, them. There are other things inside the organization that's making that happen. Um, so first, I would say, that in, so this will be my technique. Do not look at this for a, um, a we, can, we can force it to happen by a system answer. It's mm -hmm. a thing to bring it out and discuss it as a human dynamics issue. Like make it that first. Mm -hmm. And I know there's more. Come on. Uh, I something I just <laughs> so um, to piggyback off of what Ty was saying and in terms of the system and thinking of those things, I would say this. Not gonna yeah. But the reason is to think of that as like this is the thing that's going to save us and this notion of transformation. Like if you think of a health endeavor, it's not like the before and after, right? I think that thinking about goals and having goals that are at the business level, we are thinking about customers, we are thinking about outcomes is very important because otherwise you have one part of your business that's doing that. And then let's say the IT organization is only trying to become efficient, as efficient as it can be. Mm -hmm. and then we don't know why, why are we doing that? So then you you get into a balance of people aren't aligned, we don't have the same you know views, we have varying opinions, and now it's a political debate. Mm -hmm. um, and just think about the overhead of that. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't stop. It's not done. It's keep going, keep going, keep going. That's awesome. It's it's ultimately a change that's happening with or without Scrum, right? Mm -hmm. So like the whole division of business, everybody's realizing they're they're a software company in some way, right? They're using digital to like banks are not no longer competing really on the interest rates of their checking account. You know, if, if they don't have a good mobile app or or you know, they're not able to perform high frequency trading or whatever. It, they, they're relying on software so much and having that division between two different groups where one re makes requests of one and they end up going to other vendors because their own people can't. That's changing and it's all becoming one thing. And I think Scrum is just in a great position to help with that. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting um, behavior status conversation to be, to be had here and you can look at, for instance, um, there's a the PST, he did an experiment in the Netherlands where they used Scrum in the classroom. They had, you know, with the children, the children were learning to write in French and they were writing French and they were using something that's Scrum-like. Um, and so they had to learn how to do these things. And it was so interesting to watch these, these children self-manage into their teams. They were writing the, the letter together. 
And the person that it was really hard for was the teacher. Because the teacher is usually, I'm in the position of power, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. And the reversal of like, I'll be here to correct your grammar and all that stuff uh, was very, very different. And so think about that just in one classroom that's quite close versus a, a, a system that makes millions and billions of dollars. Hey, Blake, I saw a question there. If you don't mind, I want to jump on because it is a good one. Uh, can there be multiple product goals? Because I know we talked about it. I want to make sure we didn't mislead anyone. Um, so can there be multiple product goals, one for the next quarter, one for the next year? A absolutely. We're not saying like you can't ever think of anything else for it, right? It's like, but there's one goal that we're focused on right now. And then I, I would consider using a roadmap for the other ones. Right? That could be a good a collection of, of future product goals maybe might be synonymous with a roadmap. And, and if you look at some of the work, like uh, I think it, Roman Pickler has a um, strategy roadmap, I think it might be called, I forget, but it's in there, it's your product goals that we can pull in in the future. So as we're getting close to achieving this product goal, we should be looking at our roadmap. Okay, what are some other big things that we can pull in? Mm -hmm. And that can inform the creation of a, a repopulate, rejuvenate our product backlog that's focused on a new product goal afterwards, right? So we yeah. should be thinking about these future ones as well. There should, there could be many. My colleague, um, so Kurt Bittner at Swarm.org, we've been talking about outcomes a lot. And he just wrote a, a blog or a paper, a blog on the Swarm.org website called Outcome Based Roadmaps and talks about how to think about those things. I want to add to that. Even if you start lining out some um, product goals for the future, don't let a decision that you made when you were at your dumbest dictate what you're going to do so if you need to change that thing feel really free to do that like as you learn more things actually incorporate that and i learned that from traditional project management back in the day also don't let loose don't don't lose the things that you learned that were really valuable back then front load your risk um change your situation when you know you should one of the things my mentor taught me when i first started learning scrum stuff is um the plan that you have should reflect reality and that has been something that's been really hard, but it's been probably some of the most valuable information I got in that space. Yeah, that's that's the thing that it, that at, when I when I start hearing people wanting to set multiple product goals that, that go further and further into the future, I'm like, well, is this product goal going to build on this one? And then this one's going to build on that one and this one's going to build on that one. What if this one's wrong? How long <laughs> did you spend on all this? Uh, three months? Get a job, man. Do something productive. Do something you can get feedback on now. Stop waving your fingers at your crystal ball and let's get to work, right? All right. I, I do see something here. And it's, I feel like we kind of touched on it. Do we feel like OKRs are something that is going to be considered in the future of Scrum? It's a practice. It's great practice. Mm -hmm. Use it if it helps, right? So objectives and key results, um, yeah, I think what made popular by Google or even before that, yeah, I think somebody, you know, they 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 leveraged it, I suppose. But um, I think it's very much in alignment with this. Right, mm -hmm. objective is a goal, and there's a lot of key results, a lot of ways to measure our movement towards that goal. So if you wanted to leverage OKRs as a way, I mean, so Scrum, like it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't talk about any sort of practices, right? Any any way of doing it, you should be open to experiment with these things. Mm -hmm. So I like to say I use the four disciplines of executions wig template that they have for my product goal. Doesn't mean you have to. Um, OKR is probably a good thing to look at for that. You can have multiple OKR, one of them being your product goal. Um, I, I think is 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 absolutely something that you should look into and, and see if you could leverage. Yeah, I just can do it well because if you do that really poorly, you're still going to get bad results. Yeah, I think that's the important or thing that I've seen is that there were especially teams who say. We just have OKRs now and we're not allowed to experiment. We're not. And so what that does is if you're not thinking of those objectives of outcomes or with the product goal in mind and you it can transfer into micromanagement, management by objectives, those key results, you really want to think about how they're actually helping you progress toward the goal rather than just a checklist. Um, so there's this notion that we want to add in from a strong point of view, which would be value, right? How do you add value to that? And so. We actually have written a paper about that too, but um, that's why we talk about we talk about evidence based management in terms of how do you what is the evidence that you're trying to move toward those goals? How do you seek toward those goals using experimentation? Where is that validation rather than just a checklist? Right. So a little 
a little plug just it was just last week wasn't it patricia we were on a panel together about evm evidence-based management so go check out that but we talk about okrs and other things in, in that one too some of the scrum.org website goals and how that relates yeah and i think this is a good callback to something that we actually said at the very beginning of the call which is scrum is this lightweight framework and the 2020 version of the scrum guide well guess what it just got lighter we went from 13 pages to third i'm sorry 18 pages to 13 pages so it's become less prescriptive it's become less directive but that doesn't mean that it's sufficient because what you do is you take this framework and then you build on it you build on these things like okrs you build on things like the ebm you build on things that are useful and you use empiricism to find out, hey, are we going in the right direction? All right, um, just want to do a quick uh, uh, a, a quick check in. So I saw a few um, I saw a few questions that were talking about scaling. Why didn't we include anything about scaling in the the 2020 version of the Scrum Guide? Ooh, two minutes to cover that. <laughs> <laughs> One minute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I think the quick one, there is a, there's a slight nod in there around, mm -hmm. you know, multiple team. Once you get up around over 10 people on a scrum team, consider having more than one, but you still have the same product goal. You still have the same, it's the same product, same product backlog, same mm -hmm. product owner. That's about it. Because one thing we see over and over again in terms of scaling is if we can't get scrum going with just one team correctly, right? then if you try to scale, it, you're scaling that dysfunction. You might get worse, you might do less in, in less time than you can. So the focus really with Scrum is, you know, scale. Think of it as those practices. There's lots of ways to scale Scrum. There's all sorts of things out there. Um, but let's get this is how we get Scrum right first. Then you can start experimenting with all those other practices and frameworks and things that, that live around Scrum and scale. So I think I'm glad it doesn't because 90% of the time you don't need to scale. Yeah, yeah. All right, one more, and then I'm going to try to keep us really close to our time box. We're probably going over a little bit. So one of the items that came out of the Scrum Guide was adding something from the retrospective onto the sprint backlog. So what do you guys feel about that? Because I kind of missed it. I got a soapbox. <laughs> okay, so <Go. laughs> that was one of the things that I really loved. I used to love being able to say, hey, um, Continuous improvement is not optional in Scrum. Mm -hmm. And I remember like when the 2017, I was like, oh, it is no longer optional because it was like people didn't understand. We were supposed to be doing this the whole time, but they didn't take that. And now there's this. Now here's like Don helped me with this because I had to, it's almost like a therapy. <laughs> so, um, but now we're talking about like, hey, don't wait. Um, do it as soon as possible. It's not saying do not do this. It's saying do it as soon as possible. And so, um, so whoever wrote that question, that's the that's my coping mechanism for, for that particular one. <laughs> well, Again, that it's a is, fantastic practice, but it's a practice, yeah. right? Yeah, Scrum is right. going to make it. And what the Scrum Guide 2020 version is doing is moving away from prescriptive practices. All right, well, I see we have reached the end of our, our time. So first of all, I just want to say thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Don. Thank you for spending your time uh, talking to these folks. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's on the call. Thanks for attending today's uh, virtual Lunch and Learn. I hope you enjoyed listening in and hearing the perspectives that these awesome Scrum experts brought. And as always, uh, this uh, is being recorded. And so even though you won't be able to ask questions uh, listening to the recording, I mean, you can, but we won't be listening. Um, you will be able to check out this recording and we hope to see you again at the next Improving Virtual Lunch and Learn. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone.